Susan Berger from the FAIC. Go ahead. Hi, welcome. Uh, I'm glad to see we have lots of people from the East who are taking snow days. We hope that you're enjoying the snow. I wish we had some here. Um, so let me see. If you have questions about caring for collections, you can always go to our online discussion forum and uh, you'll get an answer from a real person quickly. So uh, feel free to use that service. And you can uh, keep informed about what we're doing by joining the C2CC announce list, which only is two or three messages a month. And I want to tell people who have been receiving our announcements and who have Yahoo um, uh, email addresses, those have been being purged. It's uh, by our listserv because Yahoo rejects them. And if we have had your, if your email address has been rejected five times, uh, the listserv removes it. So if you have a, a Yahoo email address and want to use this, please go and sign up again. Thanks. And you can also keep up with us on Facebook. We're also on Twitter. You can always contact me. This is my email address. And um, and if there are any disasters, uh, you can always contact the National Heritage Responders. This is their 24-hour hotline. And next month, we have two webinars, one on the care of industrial artifacts and one on working with the emergency recovery uh, vendors. So uh, be sure to tune in for those. Today, we have an entirely different kind of webinar. We've never done anything like this. And um, our, our presenter is Anna Doty. She's the uh, curator of the Muter Museum at the College of Physicians in Philadelphia, which is a, a really wonderful museum. Uh, she's an experienced uh, forensic anthropologist. She oversees the Muter Museum's disturbingly informative collection and works to provide a unique experience for its 175,000 plus annual visitors. And she's been at the museum for over a decade and has overseen the refurbishment of most of the museum store, store, storage rooms which is what she's going to talk about today. In 2014, she became the director of the Muter Institute, which is the research arm of the Muter Museum. And she still retained her title as curator. And she's lectured extensively in both the US and internationally. But this is her first webinar, so we're going to give her the chance to go. So uh, remember, I will be paying attention and collecting all the questions. You can just put them in the questions comments box and I'll save them for Anna to answer at the end. So uh, go ahead, Anna. Here we go. I am good now. All right, cool. Uh, well, this is, like I said, this is my first webinar and uh, I'm really excited to uh, do this but I'm sure there's probably going to be a bit of a learning curve and uh, I'm, this is basically a uh, presentation that is based off of a lecture I gave uh, in, in uh, November uh, and, and it's called The Cabinet of Death, Tales of Conservation and Storage from the Mutter Abditory. Now I know that you are not able to speak but you can uh, actually give me comments and questions uh, on this uh, question and comment section to the left. So this is going to be a little bit interactive. And uh, I always say I'm not above, above bribery. And so what I'd like to do is, the first thing is, I'm going to give a prize for the first person who can tell me the correct definition of the word abditory. So if somebody can tell me, and I'm going to be, this is the honor system, don't use your Google definition. If you know the, the word, you know the definition for the word abditory, please let me know. And, uh, and I will actually get your uh, mailing address from Susan, and I will email, I will, uh, excuse me, I will mail you 
uh, a little something from our Mooter gift shop. Now, I saw that uh, the sound, has the sound been turned up? It sounds like some people can't hear me uh, very well. I am speaking pretty loudly. So let me know. All right. So I'm not going to look at the things. I'll just, whatever the first person tells me, I will, uh, I will let them, I will just give them a little bit of a prize. All right. Now, moving on, because I do have a lot of slides and a short amount of time, I always like to talk about about what are my goals for the lecture. So hopefully I can keep meet all of these goals in the time I have. I, uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of the college, the museum, and the collections. I'm going to discuss um, how we conserve our unique specimens. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we pres uh, present the types of storage, uh, this type of storage we use to house our collection, uh, to showcase the unique storage issues inherent in the medical museum's collection. I'm going to discuss the importance of continued storage upgrades and the preservation of our collections. And of course, you know, I'm going to slightly disturb you. That's just pretty much the nature uh, of our collection. First, a brief history of the College of Physicians of, of Philadelphia. Now, a lot of people know the Mooter Museum, but what they don't know is that we're actually part of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. They are our parent institution. And uh, the College of Physicians is not a degree-granting institution. It's not a medical school. Uh, the term college is actually like poly. It's actually a professional society. It was started in 1787. And it was started because Philadelphia is the birthplace of American medicine. And so we were home. Philadelphia was the home of the first medical school and the first hospital. And uh, as time went on, they found themselves uh, with more hospitals, more medical schools, and there was a bit of competition. So they realized they needed to find a place uh, where they could, where all the different uh, doctors and uh, representatives of these of these competing institutions could meet on a kind of neutral platform, and that's how the College of Physicians came about. And we, like I said, we were started in 1787. We've been uh, in continuous operation ever since, and our mission hasn't changed. We still um, provide this this neutral ground. We still um, Want to provide an educational atmosphere um, for for medical knowledge, and uh, the Muda Museum, of course, is an integral uh, part of that. Now, the museum came along much later, after the college was founded, and uh, it actually became because of this handsome gentleman right here with the mutton chops, Dr. Thomas Dent Muda, and he was, of course, a fellow of the College of Physicians. He was a uh, a quite popular uh, physician at what is now called Thomas Jefferson University. And unfortunately, at a fairly young age, he found himself in ill health, and he decided to bequeath to the college his entire teaching collection, as well as a substantial endowment. And let's face it, the, the substantial endowment is the reason it's called the Mutter Museum. And as you can uh, see, you ha we have these umlauts over, these two dots over the U in Mutter, and that's why it's called the Mutter Museum and not the Mutter. Museum. Um, but most people, especially around here, know us as the Mother Museum. Uh, but we keep trying to educate people about the importance of the new round. Uh, but, you know, in the end, Mooter, Mother, just come down and say hi. So, Dr. Mooter uh, was very adamant about the collection being used for educational purposes. And really, that's what we are all about today. But with interesting is that in our over 150 year history, what's changed is that uh, it's the demographic that has changed. And what we have to do is remember that about 40 to about 40 plus years ago, um, almost everybody who came to the college was a medical professional. And that they had a base knowledge of of medicine. And now almost everybody who comes to the museum, and there's quite a bit more people, you know, when the museum first started, uh, there was a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand people a year who would come to the museum, and now we get about 175,000 people who come to the museum. Um, so we've had, the, while the collection hasn't changed much, our way we present it has had to change. Um, so that's just a little bit of uh, information about, uh, kind of background information about the museum. Here's a little 
picture of our uh, lower floor. And uh, in terms of presentation, um, one of the things I want to want to really highlight here is you can see how densely packed we are. You can see we just have lots, lots of objects. Our object per square foot uh, ratio is extremely dense, um, and that that is uh, just the nature of our collection. You can also see we have these cabinets, and that's kind of called a salon style uh, format, and that's very, very um, common that you'll see in uh, Europe. And um, we've got that, of course, that was kind of the, how it was based. Uh, that's the reason it was based um, here. That's the reason we had it the way it does. And it has its challenges. I mean, aesthetically, I think it's very pleasing, but of course, it has its particular challenges. So I'm going to talk a little bit briefly. Um, I'm just going to talk about the types of collections that we have. And I'm going to go through this uh, fairly quickly. And kind of give you a little definitions of the types of um, the collections, and we'll probably go into a little bit detail about that um, as we move, uh, move further in. But just in general, wet specimens. What am I talking about when I say a wet specimen? Um, I'm talking about any type of uh, biological specimen in its own fluid, and we have over 1,300 uh, wet specimens in our collection. And here's some examples here. That's actually a good example of um, one that we're actually working on. And again, uh, um, we'll talk in more detail about uh, what we're doing with them later. Osteological specimens, okay. Bone specimens, that's just another fancy word for bones. Uh, again, the vast majority of the osteological specimens that we have are human bones, but we do have some. Uh, animal bones, and that's just uh, that's just you know the, the nature of, again of our collection. And hold on one second. I think again I'm having some problems with the audio, but um, hold on one second. Okay. Dried specimens. So with the dried specimens, um, we don't have quite that many of them. Um, but again, you know, the, the ones that we do have are, are very, very delicate. Um, it seems to me like my audio is going in and out. I'm not sure why. I'm not moving my I'm moving my head a little bit in my with my uh, headset, but not a lot. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on with that. Um, all right, here's another little trivia challenge here. If anybody wants to be the first one to tell me what they think this object is, they'll get a prize. And I should say you have to tell me uh, the name of the condition of this uh, person, uh, or the name of the, of the uh, pathological condition that this uh, specimen represents. That's the kind of uh, that's the key. And we'll see. The first person who does that will get a little bit of a prize, again, from our wonderful Mütter Museum gift shop. So again, dried specimens have their own unique uh, challenges. Models. OK, well, we have wax models, plaster models, paper mache models. They're all different. Um, and what, it's really interesting, um, a, lot of, a lot of the patrons that, uh, that come up to me in the museum often want to know, why do you have uh, these, and a lot of the times they use the term fakes, why do you have these fakes mixed in with the real things? And uh, it provides a, like, a good teaching moment for me because um, these were never meant to uh, intentionally uh, you know, um, come off as fakes. They're actually very, very important teaching specimens. Um, for one thing, uh, they, you know, refrigeration and, and uh, you know, type, different types of preservation were hard to come by for uh, biological specimens. So it was very important uh, that they had accurate uh, models uh, again in the 18th and 19th century. And so um, models are very, very important. Sometimes uh, the models were needed because you weren't actually allowed to keep the, uh, the biological specimens. So a good example of that would be this is the uh, a, a plaster death cast of Chang and Ang Bunker. 
Um, that's the reason why the term Siamese twin exists. And uh, of course, their bodies are, are now buried in North Carolina, but uh, they, we were able to have this uh, cast of them. And in fact, we actually have their conjoined, their actual wet specimen conjoined livers um, uh, right below them on display. Now, another reason, a uh, good reason to have models is because this is an example, unfortunately I don't have a scale here, but this is about, I would say five times the size of an actual hand, and it's a plastic model, bits and pieces of it can be removed. And uh, this, was a, this was a good uh, teaching specimen, especially if you had many students and um, some of them were farther away and couldn't see uh, the details of anatomical structures up close, so it was very good to have enlarged uh, anatomically correct models so that people could actually see uh, the structures clearly. And uh, this is our Madame de Marche, uh, the Widow Sunday, this horned uh, uh, specimen. This is an accurate uh, representation uh, of what she looked like and is showing a, a corneal cutaneum. So again, very, very important, very uh, relevant uh, models and uh, very important to us. Of course, we also have a significant uh, instruments uh, in collection. We have uh, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, um, you name it. We have many, many, many uh, types of these. And of course, they represent their own uh, unique uh, storage and conservation issues as well. And of course, so many other things. And sometimes they're just very hard to, uh, to, to classify. Um, and they just kind of need their own unique um, classification system. For instance, we have here, we have um, right here, this is our soap lady. So she's not a mummy. She's not uh, a skeleton. She's not, not dried. She is her own unique adipocered body. So, um, and if she has, I could, I could do an entire lecture on, on just her alone and her unique uh, conservation issues. We have uh, historical medical photographs. Of course, they have their own um, uh, concerns and conditions. This is an iron lung. Uh, what do you do when you have extremely large, um, extremely large uh, instruments, extremely large pieces of equipment? Um, these are just a few uh, we'll try to try to uh, touch on. Now, our collection is also some things are old, some things are new, um, and and that's what's really wonderful and unique. And another thing is some of these we are we are actually an active collecting institution. Um, some medical museums uh, no longer collect. They, they're not interested in receiving new, new um, material into their collection. Um, we are. And we're interested in receiving uh, new things, whether or not they're new in general. So a good example of that would be um, <coughs> an arrow here again. This was an acquisition that came about around 20... 11. These are the slides of Albert Einstein's brain. And uh, that came, those again, they came to us in 2011, but obviously they're a lot older than that. Um, and then what I'm actually really interested in as uh, the curator here is obviously a lot of our collection represents um, 19th century pathological uh, conditions. And, and, and they represent 19th century uh, public health concerns. So obviously we have a lot of syphilis and tuberculosis uh, like that. And that's wonderful. I, I love syphilis. I love tuberculosis. It's great. Um, but also I would like to start collecting things that are more representative of 20th and 21st century public health issues. And um, of course that represents its own uh, problems. But what I'm very interested in um, are our getting what I like to call primary donations. Um, so primary biological donations. What do I mean by that? Well, this is a great example. And I'm not going to ask you uh, to guess what this is. 
because if anybody knows me, probably one person in this entire group who's going to know what that is, Alex. The only reason she's probably going to know is because she's my former intern, and that's not fair to the rest of you. Um, but this is actually my husband's gallbladder. And, um, and I should like to say he voluntarily donated it. And um, apparently, uh, I also have to say that, yes, he actually did need to have it taken out for medical reasons. Um, it's not just because I wanted it. Um, but this is a great example of a primary donation. So he is still alive. I, I, I probably should have also mentioned that. He's still alive and well. And uh, he was able to sign the deed of gift and, and give the gallbladder. And uh, of course, gallbladder conditions uh, are are um, uh, still happening to this day. And while it could have actually killed you back in the 18th or 19th century, um, and it you know it could still kill you today, it, it often doesn't. Um, and it's it's a good example of, of something that's still alive. Um, this is my first ever uh, severed diabetic feet from a 65 year old diabetic. Uh, patient who again is still alive and well, and um, very grateful that they were able to uh, to make that donation. And this is another. This is a great one. This is, by the way, is my esteemed director, Dr. Robert Hicks. And this right here is a jar of pick. Don't make that because it's a manifestation of a mental disorder. So again, I'm kind of going off on. And it's about parts of our collection, but all of these are very interesting. All of them represent uh, challenges uh, to to deal with in terms of conservation, storage, and display. And another thing is, some of these we don't actually have uh, full outright ownership of. So uh, this is a good example. This is a series of um, uh, paper mache models that are on permanent. Star Institute. So if I wanted to do any conservation on these, I would have to get official um, uh, uh, permission from the Wistar Institute. I have to go through the paperwork and, and things like that. And another issue here is what do you do when you, how do you get uh, recommendations on best practices uh, of how to conserve something when it's literally only one of one kind? Um, this is a Marie Curie piezoelectric device. Um, there's only, I believe, one other sort of like it. It's not even actually quite, quite like it. And that's at the Curie Institute uh, in, in Paris. And so, again, this is some other really interesting things that we have to uh, think about. So, let's talk numbers because, again, when you're dealing with um, conservation, you're dealing with Storage, these types of numbers are very, very important. So the entire College of Physicians building has 75,600 square feet. The Mütter Museum uh, in the college has, in total, 10,923 square feet, which represents about 14.45%. Now, of, of that, of the storage capacity, we only have 3,500 square feet and that is under 5% storage and uh, that is basically all we have another thing another thing we should mention is that um, is that there is no off-site storage at all so that's something that that I uh, sorry I'm sitting in the background nothing going on Um, that is all the storage that we have. We have no off-site storage. We have no, um, you know, anything other storage than that at all. So we do the best we can with the little space that we have. Um, another thing I should mention is that, like you saw those pictures, we have quite a lot of our collection um, on display. So most museums, especially, um, I should say most museums, so many museums you know, very, a lot of large museums have just a fraction of a percent or, or a very little percentage of, of their collection on exhibit. And uh, we, we have 
depending on the status of our inventory in a year, between 12 to 15 percent of our of our exhibit of our collection on exhibit. So again, we can we we put a lot. So, all right. Okay. So we're working on trying to get the audio to be a little bit better. Let's see if we can. I hope that's better. All right. All right. Let's see. Let me know if that's better. Moving on. All right. Conservation. Here we go. All right. Osteological conservation. Now, when I'm talking about this, um, first I have to talk about uh, our, our articulated skeletons. We have quite a few articulated skeletons, meaning that they are put together in general anatomical order. And there's lots of different ways to articulate a skeleton. You can have um, naturally articulated and artificially articulated. Um, and we have both. Um, you can also have them mounted and unmounted. And there's, so there's different ways, and every single one of those uh, types of articulation or mounting will have their own unique type of uh, uh, concerns. And again, we probably won't be able to get into detail for, in all of those, and that'll be a good thing to tackle in the questions segment um, if you can, if you want to ask the questions about that. But I'll try and get to as much detail as I can um, in the time that I have. Now, this is my wonderful collections tech, George Bergonis. He came uh, to us many, many years ago as a volunteer. And it was just so incredibly uh, wonderful and useful that we told him that, no, you, you can't be a volunteer. Um, you need to be our uh, collections tech, and we're going to pay you, and you can never, ever leave. And he's been great, and he's been here with us uh, ever since. So here's a great uh, picture of him. Uh, taking one of our skeletons and uh, doing some repair on it. You can see that what we're doing here is we're just doing some cleaning and repair issues. Um, a lot of the things with the with the uh, skeletons is is just getting all of the dirt and grime uh, off of them. Um, one of the biggest issues we had here at the uh, museum is that for years we did not have um, uh, any types of Dust mitigation. They were not in any types of protection. There were no. They weren't. Um, they were just open to the elements. And uh, when I say elements, I mean you know, this was uh, smoke, grime, dirt. Um, some of them were on exhibit for so long. Um, they were subject to uh, things like uh, oil lamps and things like that, and it was it was really bad. So uh, lots and lots of uh, uh, just just dirt, and grime over the years. Um, They also had, um, again, I'm sure m many of you probably deal with the issues of, of some of them having varnish on them. Um, so that's another uh, issue right there. So again, here you can see some, some conservation work that we're doing here. Um, the wires, of course, that we, uh, the metal that we use, we have to be very careful. Um, metal can get old. Uh, it's fragile. It can snap. That's a big issue. Um, you know, we always have to talk about physics, um, gravity. So as the skeleton has been hanging for decades and decades and decades, that, um, especially if you're, I mean, you're dealing with a uh, artificial articulation, you have got this uh, hole, you've got this metal uh, that is using it, the, the gravity is, is bearing down on it. It's just, um, it can cause that hole to, to widen. It can cause uh, the defect to, to go to be greater. Uh, it's just not it's just not a great situation. And so we have to just kind of take a look at the skeleton and determine, um, you know, can we even can it even still be uh, safely uh, displayed, or does it need to be uh, taken off taken off display? Um, here's a good uh, picture. You can see that we're doing um, again just kind of. Taking a look at it, we're doing a combination of cleaning and rewiring here, and uh, that is my that's Tova. That's Tova's arm right there. Now, this I believe you should have a handout. Um, it's called the uh, 
scroll down here. The I, it's an icon paper, and uh, it, it actually, I, if you have time to read it, you know, obviously not right now, it details uh, this whole hurdle skull mounting project that we did. This is quite a few years ago. One of the issues that we had, um, it's kind of uh, an interesting, I mean, I, it's a wonderful project, a wonderful problem to have, but it was still a problem, is that we were, being, we were a victim of our own success. And what I mean by that is that uh, when this building was built, and you saw one of the pictures, the first picture of our upper lever, we had this mezzanine that goes around. And um, when this building was built, it was built for our fellows and our fellowship. It was never meant to house 175,000 visitors coming through a year. So one of the biggest issues we had was vibrations. Uh, and it's, that was never the biggest um, biggest collateral damage we had was the hurdle skulls. So that was our, our wall of 139 skulls. And uh, they, were, they had been on exhibit for 100 plus years. And one of the things you could really see uh, was the damage that, uh, especially with the teeth, because people were walking along the mezzanine. They were causing vibrations. The vibrations were traveling up through the case to the skulls and literally rattling the skulls and rattling the teeth out of the skulls. I mean, it was just a very bad uh, situation. And so what George did is he created these specialized mounts. And again, we don't, I don't have time to go into detail of exactly how we did it, but I did provide the paper that has um, all the details for that. But they would, uh, these specialized mounts that uh, were designed to absorb the vibration um, to do that, because I, I should say that we did bring in architects, and we did um, look to see how can we um, minimize or mitigate the vibrations on a macro level um, throughout the museum. But really, it was um, it was just not just cost prohibitive, but it was this huge, massive infrastructure involving uh, you know just jackhammering into into the foundation, the concrete. And it was just something that we really couldn't undertake at the time. Uh, so we decided, OK, well, how can we uh, assess what specimens are having the worst uh, worst of it and and tackling it that way? So this is what we were able to do. And it was really the hurdle skulls that were, that were in worse shape. Um, and, and this is what we were able uh, to do. And it, it was really uh, it turned out wonderfully. So this is a good before and after. Before they were on these. Um, really horrible uh, mounts, to be perfectly honest. And after them, you can see uh, that they're on these wonderful, wonderful ones, better pictures. So again, you can see right here, this mount here, that goes right up through the foramen magnum. Okay, that, <laughs> So what that designed to do, the foramen magnum is basically that big hole in the bottom of your skull. And so all of the weight and pressure of the skull uh, would rest on the top of your skull right here. And so the vibrations would uh, just rattle and move just the entire skull would rattle around on this. It would twist and turn very, very bad. Uh, this other type of mount uh, used this three-prong method where these metal uh, tips would rest on three three the very, very delicate points of the skull. So um, I don't even know which one was worse. I think they were just that both absolutely horrible, um, especially when you had uh, this vibration situation. So again, Okay. Uh, they want us to switch to a phone bridge, so I think we're going to have to pause for a moment to do that. So hold on, everybody. Um, we're going to try and do something. So please pause.
one. Okay. All right. Can people hear me now? Hold on. We're just dealing with an echo. That's me. Okay. Go ahead, please. All right. Can everybody hear me? All right. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Here we go. Okay. I think we're okay now. I'm on my I'm on my phone, so I'm off of my um, McDonald's headset right now. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's see if we can proceed. I apologize for that. So where were where, where was I? Let me get my. All right. I am showing you now the horrible mounts, and we're going to go now to the nice mounts. Oh, nope, we're not going to go back to that. We're going to show you. Ah, so that actually, what you're going to see now, that's the um, the public. That's I actually, you should be having a, co a copy of that. The in practice, okay. So, if you have any questions for that, you can use, you can look at that publication. But of course, I'm happy to answer anything about that. So we're going to move on now because I know we're we had a little bit of a, a hiccup in time. So I'm going to kind of go a little bit faster here um, for. Wet specimen conservation. Okay. Now, obviously, this is a huge topic. I'm just going to touch on some of the basics and some of the things that um, that we do here. And um, you know, there's some things that we can. Um, there's my arrow that we can uh, touch, touch on. There's some things that obviously I'll try to try to get to uh, as, as best as I can. Um, but for us, I mean, everybody has their own. Uh, goals for the wet specimens. For, for our main goals um, is our stabilization. So we want to make sure that all the ones that we have in uh, formaldehyde or formalin, we get them out of that. And why? Well, because um, it's just formalin for us, it's, it's very caustic. Um, you know, we do not have any hermetically sealed uh, cases or cabinets for our visitors. So uh, anything that goes on display, of course, we do not want to, we want to make sure it does not have any uh, formaldehyde or formalin in it. Um, we want to make sure everything, of course, is in a stable, stable container with a proper seal. And of course, we want to provide uh, a stable storage area to stay, safely store the specimens. Those are our main goals when dealing with our um, wet specimens. So how do we, you know, this is, this is of course, the rest of the thing I'll talk about is how do we do that. Um, what you're looking at right here, this picture, is actually what I was talking about with Chang and Ang before. This is their preserved uh, specimens right he uh, here. This is their preserved, their preserved uh, and conjoined, I should mention, livers right here. And my arrow is not working. Uh, but that's what that is right there. And it's, it's kind of hard to see, but there's actually a very... Uh, little area there of conjoining and that uh, where is that that area is where the band was where they were conjoined um, which is really interesting because uh, Chang um, how do I say this nicely he liked his alcoholic beverages and Ang was a teetotaler um, and so one of these livers is a little cirrhotic and the other one isn't and I bet you can guess which liver belonged to which twin um, but I digress anyway preserving solutions there are so many. And again, a lot of these specimens, um, when they came to us, and they, again, they came to us at all different time periods. They came to us um, uh, you know, from all different places, and uh, and they're still coming. They're still coming to us. Like I mentioned, they, we still are actively collecting. And when I started here in 2004, um, one of my first jobs was to kind of assess all of our wet specimens. Um, and uh, I this was a very interesting uh, job, and I did it in um, a room with a absolutely no ventilation. So um, probably why I have significant gaps in my memory in pretty much 2004. But uh, so anyway, preserving solutions. What's really interesting is that again, um, the majority of our wet specimens are mid 19th century. Now, which, what's interesting is that uh, formalin really it wasn't invented until around. Uh, I believe it was around 1880s or so, and it what didn't make it. I didn't really figure out that it made a good tissue fixative until around the 1890s. And so, what's interesting is that um, you know, if, if we have certain, we have certain types of specimen containers that we know absolutely can't have formalin in them because. Uh, of the way that they're sealed, and again, because formalin hadn't been invented at the time that they were uh, initially put into their container, so that's pretty much interesting. But for the rest of them, you know, it, it could be alcohol, it could be formalin, and then we've got these other really interesting um, 
preserving solutions. Methyl salicylate, that's actually like an oil of wintergreen. Um, and really interesting thing there is that that is highly, highly toxic, but only if ingested. Um, and uh, so when you when you smell it, it's not not entirely pleasant. It's kind of like a sickly sweet, again, wintergreen. Um, but it's it's very toxic in that instance. Uh, we also have phenol, glycerin, and again, especially with these 19th century collections, we have these proprietary solutions, um, which is short for saying, I have absolutely no idea what's in them. So especially dealing with these uh, these 19th century collections where we have these proprietary solutions, we're kind of going in there blind. And we really have no idea um, what we're dealing with. And so we're very cautious. We make sure um, when we're uh, opening up the uh, the specimen uh, that we do so with the utmost of caution. And uh, you know what we basically need to do is just kind of assess the general condition of the specimen. And I should mention that before we do that, we kind of have a, uh, a grading system for our specimens. They're kind of a given a number grade between 1 and 5, uh, 1 being that they're in, they're in good shape. They don't really need any conservation. And 5, mean, and, and five is, is, war, is really bad. So 5 is they, they need care absolutely immediately. Um, let's not really hesitate. So obviously, you know, the, the, the fives, you know, when we do the triage, that we just do that. We try and get to the fives as quickly as possible. Um, this is one of our, uh, this is one of our semester long, uh, wet specimen interns. Her name was Soyo. And, uh, she came in and she was a very interesting, um, intern in that she had advanced degrees in both biology and art. And so she was very interesting in that she was, uh, she came to us with these two kind of, um, complementary uh, skills that she, we were able to um, to to utilize, and so here she is uh, doing some uh, conservation on our one of our uh, fetal specimens right here. So this is a good example. All right, so I'm going to kind of walk you through a. Um, a, a I'm not going to say a typical because. In my experience here is I just cannot give you a quote unquote typical um, uh, you know specimen. Every single one is unique. but uh, this is just an example of 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 how we would kind of do um, a a wet specimen conservation. So this is um one of our specimens. It's actually three, four, seven, nine. So this is this is the initial picture you can see of it. It's actually, you know, this is we haven't done anything to it. This is what it looks like. So you can see it's very very dark. You can't even really see um, the specimen through the the fluid. Um, and again, what kind of fluid is it? Absolutely no idea. Okay. So once we take uh, the the uh, specimen out of the fluid. Um, we can actually see that up. Oh, we've got a situation here. We've got residual mold um, encrusting the specimen. But we also, basically, we can do a sniff test. Um, and we could find out that, OK, it's got a phenol smell. OK, there we go. Um, now, are there extremely um, scientific ways of doing chemical testing to determine the type of fluid that you have? Absolutely, absolutely. There's lots of bit ways, and they cost a lot of money, and we do not have that capability. Um, so, if you do have that budget, or if you are um, part of a larger institution that has um, access to a chemistry lab, by all means, um, go ahead and, and get that done. But if you are a smaller institution, you're going to have to do uh, probably have to do something like we do and find these workarounds and, and do the best that you can do um, in the absence of these uh, large budgets or the absence of having these types of uh, expensive um, equipment. But I do recommend just don't stick your face in the wet specimen jar and take a big whiff. I'm not advocating that. Um, so. Next thing we have to do is mount assessment and fabrication. Um, so one of the things I should say is that you know yes we don't have um, you know we don't have a chemistry a huge chemistry laboratory we don't have um, 
access to a lot of those uh, to to an SEM or, or you know type those types of things. But we have over the years been able to um, slowly amass specific types of equipment that have helped us. So we actually do have a, a glass cutter. So we have um, our own. Uh, water uh, uh, distilling. We can make our own distilled water. So we can do uh, certain things like that that have been able to greatly um, uh, help us over the years in, 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 um, in, in maintaining our wet specimens. Now, in terms of the mount assessment, we can see here that the, these uh, glass, the glass rod that this specimen uh, was on that was broken. Um, so what we did in this tape, in this instance, is we attempted to create a new mounting frame out of acrylic. Um, and this is this is all a learning situation. We're always trying new things here, and we found that while the acrylic um, frame was stable, the glue joints failed. And so that's something that we've been experimenting with over the years: is that um, is that finding a good adhesive that can maintain its integrity in different types of um, uh, liquids, especially solvents, is very very key. Um, so. Uh, it turns out that, that we weren't able to do that, but we were able to use a glass plate that we cut and we actually drilled it for putting, um, and then we used sutures to to actually mount the specimen. So we rinsed the specimen uh, with a deionized water, and this is this is something that again this takes a very long time. We're actually giving you dates here, so the, this 10 slash 25 means um, again October 25th. So you can see when we started. Uh, you start out with a uh, fresh deionized water uh, solution here, and then what we're doing here is the goal is you is you're bringing up this um, uh, solution into eventually 70% um, ethanol, and again 30% water. So that is our preferred uh, solution for our specimens, and and that's what. Um, we tend to use now again. Uh, you know, if you're in the UK, you aren't allowed to do that. Okay, in the UK, I think um, for the people I've talked to there, you have to use a Kaiserling solution. So um, wherever you are, talk to your uh, departments. You know, see if if you know what solutions you're able to use. We are able to use um, a 70% uh, you know alcohol, 30% water uh, solution. Um, now, another thing that we've also found out is that there are certain solutions that once they are in that, they can't go into anything else. If, you're, if you have a wet specimen that is in a methyl salicylate, it can only ever go into methyl salicylate. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't mean you can't take it out, clean it, you know, clean the, clean the, clean the uh, jar, put it, or put it into a different jar. But what I am saying is that it, it has to go back into that same type of fluid. If you try to put it into a different fluid, um, it won't go well. Don't ask me how I know that. <clears throat> Trial and error. So um, that's one of the things. So, but if it has been, if it's in a formalin, if it's in a phenol um, solution, it can go. Uh, it can then go into a ethanol water solution. Okay. Um, in fact, one of the things we we know is that. Um, it can an object can be uh, fixed in a formalin solution for o even just a couple of days, um, and then it can go into uh, the ethanol uh, water solution, and it will be completely fine. It does not need to be in formalin for days, weeks, months, or years um, for it to be quote unquote fixed. Okay, it needs a very small amount of time. Uh, in fact, one of the issues we have kind of the opposite issue that we're dealing with for us is that we do have specimens that have been in, uh, unfortunately, a very high concentration of formalin for decades and decades and decades, and then we're dealing with the aftermath of that, trying to get all that residual formalin out of the tissue, um, and that's and again, you know, that's something that you know we're, we're dealing with, and it's it's causing issues. So. Um, one of the things that that I hopefully we'll be able to get a chance to talk to a little bit more. Um, so you can see here, just uh, you cannot you cannot um, put a specimen just immediately into the seventy percent. It has to be brought up uh, gradually into the solution. Obviously, you want to put it back into a cleaned container. It can either you know if you have to again assess the situation of your original container. Um, is that container stable? Does it have any uh, cracks or defects that might um, compromise it? Um, 
Now, the restored old label, that's interesting. Um, we, if you can see here, let me get my arrow again. This is the original label right here. That is external to the uh, jar. This is our new label. This is internal to the jar. Okay, and that is on, that is a special, I believe, Tyvek-like material printed with special ink, and it's on the inside of the jar. Now, why would I put the, spe the label for the specimen on the inside of the jar, not on the outside of the jar? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? First person to comment on why I would put it on the inside of the jar. Wins a special. Let me see. I will mail you. There we go. Uh, wait, outside the jar, I think it was Michelle. Is that you, Michelle? All right, Michelle, I'm going to give you plushy syphilis from our store, okay? So, Susan, make sure the, make sure it's Michelle that gets some plushy syphilis. Remind me, okay? All right, that's exactly it. If it, You cannot, uh, uh, if, the spe if the label is on the inside of the jar, it can't fall off. Simple as that. And also, we use a, an ink that won't fade. Um, because I, I'm not going to tell you how many wet specimens we have with, with partial labels or labels just with nice little adhesive patches where a label once was um, because I don't want to think about it because it makes me sad. Um, but we have quite a few. And, and it's just very, very frustrating because that represents lost information that we may or may not ever get back. And we all know that a, a missing label is a missing link and it's information that is gone and you just can't get you just can't get it back. Um, so I highly recommend doing this and um, if I, I what I can do and will do is um, uh, afterwards is I will provide specs on uh, exactly what we make our labels our internal labels from because I don't think I provided that in my initial um, materials list or or any of these things so um, hopefully Susan will remind me to do that and I'll provide that for you because I really do think it's very, very important. Um, again, so again, remounting the specimen, we did this with a glass plate and resealing the lid. What do we use to reseal the lid? We use a clear silicone caulk. And again, uh, I try, I'm going to try and do this quickly. I'm not even sure how we are on time, but we're way behind on time. Okay. Um, I use a clear silicone caulk because it's not permanent, okay? And, and it it's provides a very, very good um, seal, but I can easily open it up to top off the uh, container with more um, of my solution. So um, that's something that's very, very important, is that I don't want to use any t anything that is going to be extremely hard to get, to, get, um, to get it off when I'm doing uh, conservation because... Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a situation where there's no such thing as a perfect seal. I mean, if that could be my one mantra for wet specimen conservation, um, if that's the one thing I would like just, just repeat over and over and over again, that would be it. There is no such thing as a perfect seal. Just acknowledge it, accept it, let, let that, let that acceptance move through you like a wave and use that knowledge to to deal with it, basically, and know that you are you are going to have to um, to to deal with with fluid leakage, with seepage, with evaporation, with all of those issues that come with it. Um, I use a very 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 high tech method of maintaining um, my my kind of eye on the fluid lines of my specimens, and that's called a china marker. I take a china marker and usually a red one because it's it's nice. And of course, you know, these are the, usually the ones that are not on display, although I think I use the ones that are on display as well. And I just take it and I mark the fluid line right there and I give it a date. And then I, uh, maybe a year down the line, if I see that the fluid line is down here, I know I have to address that. So that's one of the basic uh, basic things that I that I do that's, that's huh, like I was, no, obviously, I was kidding. It's very low tech, but very effective, um, and and I can actually keep keep my eye on on the fluid uh, situation that way. So again, we uh, we have we are way beyond uh, the time limit on that, and that's just uh, a sampling of the uh, wet specimen things. And hopefully, I'll be able to get to a lot more um, 
with the the question and answer period. Now I'm going to talk about some non-biologicals. Well, I guess a couple of things in here are biologicals. But for the most part, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we do with uh, some of these uh, unique specimens of the Chevalier Jackson collection. And these are, uh, the Chevalier Jackson collection um, is a collection of over 2,000 objects um, of various sorts that were all, and that one unique thing about all of them is they were all removed from people's throats by Dr. Chevalier Jackson. So it's a collection of swallowed and aspirated uh, objects. Um, and so they were all removed over a period of, um, of time from, it was actually over the period of the career of Dr. Chevalier Jackson. And so, again, when I say uh, different things, I mean it's everything from Safety pins, which, by the way, he called danger pins, and I now I now personally call safety pins danger pins. Um, straight pins, buttons, toys. There are some um, uh, food-related objects. Um, uh, you know, you, you name it. Uh, dentures, uh, plastic pieces of plastic. All these different types of of objects, um, and so it's it's it, they're all different types of things, but they're all on these unique um, little framed, uh, matte framed uh, little compartments. And we, uh, we have them all displayed in kind of uh, flat files uh, with plexiglass over them. But each one of these, so this is glass coated here. And again, um, I'm going to go over this pretty quickly because I did, I believe I did provide you with um, a paper that we did on this. So you should have a little bit more detail about this. Um, but this was really interesting but of course, because, of course, this was all done. Uh, Dr. Jackson was born the year after uh, the Civil War. And he lived to be in his early 90s. And he practiced up until a um, couple years prior to his death. So we're talking the, his, his, the majority of his practice was late, late 19th century into the 20th century. Um, and so the objects there uh, that he collected really reflect that. So, of course, one of the issues that we had is that what he uh, used to mount this collection is all acidic. So this paper is acidic, the map board is acidic, everything. So we really had to deal to, to deal with this. So really quickly, and again, you'll have to, you'll, you can see, these are just some of the things that we had to deal with here. So every single one of these um, we had to remove. We had to put on non-acidic paper. We had to clean. We had to clean. Um, the wooden, uh, we had to repair the wooden um, frame. Remember how I talked about we have our own glass uh, cutting uh, instrument here? That came in very handy when we had to cut our own pieces of glass. Uh, everything had to be uh, uh, deacidified and remounted. I think we, we just replaced, uh, replaced everything, remounted it, and then Relabeled. Very, uh, it was a very labor-intensive um, thing. But here's a very good example of a before and after. Before conservation is on the left, and you can see. Now, you can imagine this times. Oh gosh, I don't even remember how many of these individual units that we have. If you can imagine, we have over two thousand uh, objects. So this is quite uh, quite an undertaking. Um, but it was, again, uh, well, well worth it. Again, you should have a copy of this. Um, so that's why I'm kind of sorry to be so brief, but I figured let's go through this quickly because you have a nice uh, article that kind of sums it up. And let's talk about storage quickly. All right, storage issues. All right, when we're talking about um, osteological storage issues, um, they are, have much less issues than, of course, our wet specimens. So basically, the, the, if, if a human, if a living human <laughs> um, likes, the, likes the way the, the room feels, the, the skeleton would probably pretty much like the way it feels, too. So you're looking at a relative temperature, relative humidity. One of the things uh, we're really trying to work on is keeping dust down. That's a big issue. Skeletons and dust do not get along very well. And like I said, gravity is a big issue here. We really have to work, watch um, about uh, long-term storage of our articulated 
skeletons because we really have to mem remember that um, the longer the stress is put on these specimens, um, that it, it just, even though they're not being moved, uh, you know, so even if they're in a storage situation where they might not be having significant vibration or they might not be, um, they might not, they're not being moved or, or anything like that, they're not, they might not be what we would think of being as taxed in any way, shape, or form. The, the nature of, of the gravitational pull of the planet pulling on their joints, that is enough to cause them stress. So that's something we have to, um, to take into consideration. Um, but unfortunately for us, the nature of our specimen storage, and this is uh, our this is our osteological storage collection. Um, this is the same room I should mention. So you can see here that um, this is then and now. So uh, to the left is the uh, way the way it used to look, and to the right is the way it looks now. But you can still see that we have no way of storing our skeletons in any kind of horizontal uh, position. So they are still having to be stored upright. They're still at the, kind of at the mercy of of gravity, but some of the things that we were able to um, to, to take care of, and the things that I'm very um, proud of, what we were able to do is, um, first of all, the um, we have mobile shelving. That was a huge thing because that was able to greatly reduce, um, or greatly, I should say, increase our storage capabilities. Um, we have all of these are antimicrobial. I think I lost my my. My green arrow is not working again, so I don't know why. But um, uh, if you can look down, you can see the green shelving. These are called metro shelving. They're all adjustable, so all of the um, they're and they're not even really they're, they're very um, small gradations. So I can really adjust them very fine. The granularity is very fine on these, um, so I can adjust them very easily, and um, I can. Uh, you know, so again, you can see that they're very different. All of them are at kind of different levels. They're moving on the tracks. I ha everything is acid-free and archival. So the, even the, the shelves themselves are antimicrobial. I've got everything padded. Um, one thing you can't see, and I don't think I have a picture of it, is um, there's even a giant, it's basically like a giant sticky pad on your way into their room, and that's a dust catcher. So it catches the um, dust on your shoes to kind of reduce the dust. Because one of the things they had in the old wet specimen, in the old uh, osteological room, I should say, is if you look to the left, let me see if my, still not working, but if, oh, wait, here we go. All right, see that there? That is old plastic sheeting, and they basically had like these shower curtains going across um, the, the skeletons, and that was just, all it was doing was just gathering dust and making it even worse. Uh, for the skeletons, and so we realized that 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 type of physical barrier was just actually trapping the dirt um, for the skeletons, and it was not it was just not a good situation. And you can see here again, um, dirt. You know, you had they had a lot of this uh, situation where the, the the skeletal material was being wrapped in. But again, if you're wrapping dirty material, you're not. It's not doing any good. It's not helping. And and having the plastic wrap thing, it, it we just realized it's just not a good situation. So the best thing to do is we cleaned everything. Every single one of these uh, specimens was, again, carefully cleaned and um, and put in this bright, nice, wonderful uh, stored storage room. And um, again, the, the cleaning was, again, not done with any kind of, um, uh, without any, you know, Solvents or anything like that. It was it was distilled water, very and 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 a lot of it was dry brushing and and using um very uh, special uh, types of, of of brushes and things like that. So it's very kind of um you know very low low maintenance, just is very um, simple but very very effective. You know we really don't want to use harsh chemicals or any types of solvents unless we absolutely needed to. Now when it comes to removing um, when it comes to removing uh, uh, shellac and stuff, that's different. Then you obviously need to do something with that. But when it comes to just general removing of the grime. Now, um, you're probably wondering, how good are these tracks in when it comes to um, how smooth are they? Well, the one thing I should mention is that the bones are, are quite light. Okay, so the, they're, they're, this, this unit is, these units are not very heavy. And as a result, they, they glide very, 
very smoothly. And so I, I wish I could have embedded a video of me actually moving these because they, they glide seamlessly and the specimens don't, aren't jostled at all. Okay. Um, but that, so one of the things though that we had, mm, gosh, how many, how many years ago do we have the earthquake? Uh, the one that started, there was an earthquake, the epicenter was in Virginia. Um, and it did actually, it was about four years ago. And that gave me enough of a, oh, thank you, 2011. That, that gave me enough of a pause to realize I think I am going to install, um, maybe some earthquake bars or uh, something along those lines just in case, um, to, to help out. Um, I'm going to look for some funding to get that done. So, um, when the when the when the shelves are the way they are right now, they're and they're compacted, they're pretty good. But of course, you've got them always one shelf that's exposed like that. So um, I am concerned that you know if we have another earthquake, um, I might be um, leaving myself vulnerable to that. So that is something that I'm actively um, trying to deal with is getting a um, it's getting some protection in, in that in that way. And I actually went to the material um, that the museum support center. I think that's what it called of the Smithsonian, and I went to the invertebrate section, and they have some beautiful um, storage there, and uh, they have the earthquake bars because I I believe they had some significant, I wouldn't say they had some damage um, after that earthquake because they were a lot closer, and I I was talking to one of their employees there, and she gave me some um, some recommendations, so um, that is something that I'm actively looking into. So I actually have. Uh, a lot of wet specimen storage uh, tails. So when I first started in my wet wetlands here in 2004, this wasn't even, this wasn't even, this was the, I can't even show you what the wet specimen room looked like. The, I moved everything into this wet specimen room. Notice, if you will, the carpet. Um, there was no climate control. Uh, there was absorbent tiles. There was, um, it was so bad that we were only allowed in there for about five minutes at a time, and it was it was extremely hazardous. So what we uh, I was able to get the funding, and that room turned into this room, and you can see that it's very similar. Um, and I installed a special air handler that uh, did, did six air exchanges per hour, so it basically sucked out all the fumes, filtered them, and sucked them out. And then again, this is the same thing we're dealing with. These are metro shelving, antimicrobial shelving with um, archival foam. Uh, I should mention these are not um, metro; these are not um, movable shelves. Shelving these are these aren't movable shelves, um, but they have the foam on them, and um, and uh, the, this is a poured concrete floor. Um, and then I have use, I have excuse me hospital grade tiles. Every single surface in this room is designed to not ha uh, not absorb odors, and that is very very important because if you have anything that can absorb odors, no matter how much air you have you have sucked out of your room, it, it, over time it'll just creep up on you. Okay, that the smell will just creep up on you. If that smell creeps up on you, you won't be able to spend any time in there because it'll just start causing uh, headaches and start causing issues. So you really have to make sure that everything in your um, wet specimen storage area won't absorb odors. So when it comes to storage, um, in terms of your personal health and safety, you have to think get you know you have to think um, uh, you have to think very very much in getting the uh, proper ventilation. And you have to think in terms of getting all of the um, uh, no no nothing that can be absorbent. So that's very very important. Uh, in terms of climate control, we had not one but two redundant uh, cooling systems. Um, now our particular uh, issue, we never had to worry about heating um, this unit because the um, we have we even though we are in the basement, there is a sub basement to our. Uh, to our college, and that uh, we are kind of di almost directly underneath uh, a main artery to the boiler. That so it's basically, if you think of the boiler as the heart of the um, college, we're underneath like the, the the aorta. So a huge amount of of, of heat uh, comes under this floor when the the heat is turned on in the winter. Uh, and so, believe it or not, we have to keep uh, two of our coolers on most of the time in January and February. Um, so 
uh, our, our air conditioners are on 24-7, and they have to maintain, uh, we like it to be no more than 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Ideally, I like to keep it around 68 degrees Fahrenheit with a temp the humidity, uh, you know, between about 40 percent humidity is nice, plus or minus, you know, 5 percent is, is fine, but it's really the temperature that I'm more concerned about, and it's uh, 68 is my golden. Um, it can go down to 65. That's fine. It never, ever, ever should exceed 72 degrees. That's bad. Um, so that's what I like. Now, we recently upgraded to a new wet specimen storage facility. Um, and this one is absolutely wonderful uh, as well. And you can see it here. This is our in-house conservation. Uh, so this room, as well as having the storage, also has, we can do our conservation uh, in-house. And we had that in the other area as well. But um, we um, can actually have a longer space here. You can't see it here, but I have a dishwasher. I have a dishwasher, people. So I can actually really uh, properly clean my jars. Um, I have you know, all these uh, cabinets. I have a wonderful amount of space here to do um, all of my conservation in the same climate controlled area where the specimens are stored. That's really, really key um, because unfortunately, some of these specimens are never ever going to be able to go out on display. They're just too, um, they're just too delicate, okay? So um, are those dog training pads on the countertop? We prefer to call them um, medical pads, but um, yeah, they are. Um, OK. <laughs> I know I'm really running low on short on time. All right, mobile storage. I'm, I'm calling it just now because there's no now and then. We have not got around to um, doing any kind of uh, conservation on that. And you can see that it desperately, desperately needs it. Um, and I'm aware, and we've got about 16,000 objects in our um, in our in our mobile storage that um, you know have to have to be properly stored and conserved, and that is definitely high on my radar, and I'm definitely going to uh, be addressing that very soon. So of course I called this the cabinet of death, and why am I calling this the cabinet of death? Well, my boss loves hyperbole, and uh, we do have this one cabinet in our mobile storage that has um, been dubbed the cabinet of death because when you open it, there is uh, how do I say it? an odor, quite a pungent odor. Um, but those of us who who are well acquainted with the actual smell of death will know that it does not smell like human decomposition. What it actually smells like is um, decomposing organic varnish, which I think actually smells worse than a decomposing body, but that is purely my opinion. Um, but what I love here is this is uh, actually like baking soda circa 1980-something. And when I, when I first, I just thought that was great. And I'm, I'm keeping it there. Why? Because I can. Um, and uh, it's just, it's a relic from Gretchen's time, and I thought it was cute, and I'm keeping it there. Eventually, it'll go when I when I um, am getting around to redoing this. But so that's that's our big uh, cabinet of death, and I think it's probably a little bit of a letdown for everybody who's wondering what it was. Um, we're not. Even, we're just going to briefly talk about this because we are running very very low on time. But I wanted to show you that um, this is an aerial view of the College of Physicians. And one of the things a lot of people don't know about us is we have an amazing library. And we actually have a library stack storage. The museum has a small amount of space in our stack storage. But the way that the stacks are configured in the building is actually really interesting. And it's interesting because you uh, I always call it the TARDIS uh, configuration because we have a three-story building. But we have seven stories of stacks. So if anybody is a Whovian, it's actually funny. If you're not a Whovian, never mind. And you should be. All right, this is a cross section. So what you're looking at here, uh, this is our library stack. So look at the bottom, look at the bottom right. This is our, this is our library stacks here. OK, so when the building was built, this is a wonderful representation of the, of what the priority of the college was at the time. So think about how much space the museum has. Think about how much space the library has. Eh? The library was the star of the college. Okay, Things have changed. I love the library, but um, 
it is no longer it is no longer the the driving force of the college. The 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 museum other than the endowment of the college, the museum is the revenue generator of the college. So one of the things we are looking to do is to figure out how we can um, utilize some of this stack storage uh, for increased museum exhibition space. So we'll see, fingers crossed, that in the next uh, year, if we can raise the capital, we're going to be expanding the museum exhibition space, maybe some storage space, maybe things like that, um, to, to hopefully greater um, to, to have some expansion. But I really wanted to show you guys uh, the stacks because they're absolutely amazing. Um, is this a glass floor? Yes, this is a glass floor. What have I learned about this? Well, I have learned one very important thing. When you take people on a tour and you take them on a tour of the stacks, you must ask them if they have vertigo issues before you take them into the stacks. Um, because otherwise you might have some problems. What you're looking at right here is you're looking all the way down through seven stories. If you drop your pen uh, down, or I should say pencil, because you really shouldn't bring a pen into the library stacks, it's going to go all the way down to the Hellmouth. And if you don't understand what a Hellmouth is, you should. OK, um, moving on. I'm just dropping Buffy the Vampire Slayer <laughs> references all the way. All right, all right, we're really running low on time. We're going to go in here now to storage issues, loss of climate control. What happens when you lose climate control? Bad things happen. Bad, bad, bad. Remember when I said that we have issues with um, having, uh, it's very, very hot in January and February? Well, we used to not have two redundant uh Air conditioners. We lost one of the. We lost our air conditioner in fe in February. I got very very hot in our storage area. This is what happened, right here. What is this? This is a lovely combination of lipids and formaldehyde. And this is what happens when solution when when um uh, it comes out of solution. And the only uh, thing you can do for this is again keep it in a cold environment. Um, this is a physical problem. You could, what we did is we just took this the specimen out rinse them off, put them back in a clean solution. I'm going to have to go through all these really quickly. I know we're really lo running low on time. Second thing, specimen is damaged beyond repair. What are you going to do? People, let it go. It's not going to do you any good. Storage issue number three, this is my iron lung. Where is my iron lung? My iron lung is in the hallway. Why? Because there's literally no other room. So what do I do? I put up a display card. And I treat it as a very, very, very special treat when people get to come on the hot, back behind the scenes tours. They actually get to have a little experience. So nobody knows that this iron lung is in the hallway because we don't have room for it. They think they're getting a little treat. So now all of you know, and don't you dare tell anybody any different. This is an extra special treat. Everybody got that? Moving on. Issue number four, when your collection is trying to kill you. I actually have an entire entire separate long lecture on what do you do when your collection is trying to kill you. The most important thing to do is don't panic. Know who to call. Are you going to call the bomb squad, the hazmat squad, the CDC? Follow your protocol. That's basically what you need to do. If it's radioactive, who are you going to call? Well, in our issues, you, we basically have a guy. I, do I have a, I have a radioactive guy. Um, but one of the basic things I do now is I have my own radiation detector. And uh, every single specimen that comes, or every single new donation that comes to me, whether it is paper-based, whether it is um, anything innocuous, it will get scanned. Because one of the things we have learned the hard way is you never know what's radioactive and what's not, especially, especially if it's medical. So lessons learned. For instance, just because something is empty does not mean it's not radioactive, OK? I think I'm probably going to be scaring a lot of people right here. But of course, we all know what um, residue is, right? What this is, and also one of the things that's interesting is if it, even if it does say that it is radioactive, it might not be. This is uh, supposed to be a water crock, the entire base of which is made with uh, radium. You're supposed to fill this up with water and drink eight glasses of uh, irradiated water a day. You know for health reasons. Um, we actually did have one that was real, and that has subsequently been removed. This one is actually a fake. So of course, you know, we did keep it because it's, it's, a, uh, it's a fake, and it's not, um, it's not uh, 
causing any problems. This is actually really interesting, and I wish I had more time to talk about it. But one thing you have to be very careful about is um, the status of your chemistry, whether or not you have um, pharmaceuticals, whether or not you have chemi uh, chemistry or chemical products. Um, are they still in their liquid form? Are they still um, are they still whatever form they're supposed to be in? Are they, are they crystalline? Are they liquid? If they're supposed to be um, liquid and they are crystalline, is that a bad thing? A very good example of that would be picric acid. Picric acid, when it is liquid, is completely safe. Picric acid, when it is dried out and it has become crystalled or crystalline, is completely not safe, people. It is not safe. It is what we call a concussive explosive, okay? It will explode if you jostle it, okay? So uh, this is one of the things where you really need to uh, go back to your collection and just do it a search for picric acid because that's exactly what I did. I was on a listserv. I saw somebody asked a question about picric acid, and suddenly I saw the entire uh, thread of that conversation blow up, pun intended. And that got me thinking, maybe I need to do something about this. Um, so I, 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 that's exactly what I did. And, and lo and behold, yep, I had picric acid in my collection. And <laughs> so what do I do? I call the bomb squad. And I tell them, I, I call the bomb squad, I tell the bomb squad my situation. The bomb squad says, well, it's an explosive substance, but it's not a quote-unquote bomb. You need to call the hazmat squad. Fine call the hazmat squad. They said, well, it's a hazardous substance, but it's an explosive hazardous substance, so you need to call the bomb squad. Are you kidding me? So this kind of went on back and forth until basically I threatened to put an egg timer on the box that this was in and called 911. And um, finally, one of the bomb squad guys took pity on me and uh, actually just showed up. I, I, to this day, I don't even know if he did this on the books, off the books. I don't know. I don't care. He showed up in full hurt locker, you know, that, that full-on garb. He was carrying a, uh, again, an extremely high-tech piece of equipment. It was a uh, five-gallon paint bucket. It was half filled with sand. And he came in, and he took the jar, and it turned out the jar just had a little bit of residue in it. But, of course, we didn't go in there to find out. And put that jar in the um, in the bucket, filled, the re filled it up the rest of the way with sand, and walked away. We call that an emergency deaccession. So that's how we handled that. You, you just got to do what you got to do. And uh, so I, I hope... I hope none of you have to, to go through that, but if you do, just know that, that there are ways to do it. Um, I've heard a lot of uh, situations where people have actually had to detonate their picric acid in their parking lot. We're in the middle. We are literally in the middle of a city, so I really don't think that would have gone well. Um, but that, again, you know, that, that, that is an option if you're in a more rural situation. Um, if that does happen, please get it on video and send it to me. All right, last, I think hopefully this is one of the last things to do is, of course, you know, I'm sure everybody has these issues. What do you do when you find smallpox scabs in your collection? I'm sure everybody's going to have to deal with this at one point or the other, right? Because we sure did. Um, this is a really flattering picture of myself in some um, level one or two PPE. Um, we found, uh, this again, what I should preface this is what happens when you leave your director unattended for one day. I took my staff on a field trip actually to the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Bethesda. I don't know if there's anybody here representing uh, from that museum. Uh, but if you, uh, if you have a chance to go there, I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful museum. Um, but I took all of my staff except for my director uh, there. And my director decides to go uh, snooping around mobile storage. And uh, basically, he decides, he's like, hmm, I'm going to look into our phlebotomy section, our bloodletting section looks in our bloodletting section and finds, wait, those don't look like bloodletting kits. I'm going to open them up. Opens them up. Oh, look. Those are vaccination kits. Those look like smallpox scabs. Okay, I think I'm going to take these out and put them on my desk on paper plates because that is the smart thing to do. So he does, and he calls me. Meanwhile, I'm in a van somewhere between Maryland and Pennsylvania. I get this call. And I'm like, there are no words. Um, well, there are words, but I really can't repeat them. 
right now of exactly what I said. Um, but he's like, you might want to call the CDC tomorrow and let them know. And, I, of course, I was like, you think? So I called the CDC the next day, and um, I believe the technical term was I threw him under the bus. And I said, this is what, he, this is what my director did. And he, ha he came so close to having his butt quarantined for three weeks, it wasn't even funny. Um, but it all worked out. It actually all worked out, believe it or not, amazingly well in the sense that we were, were able, we actually turned this, what could have potentially been a nightmare, into an amazing international smallpox vaccination project. So we've actually now have, that we found this amazing collection of smallpox scabs. Uh, again, long story short, we were able to uh, get DNA from all of these scabs um, to find out exactly what kind of vaccination material they are. And it turns out they're a really interesting type of orthopox. So what could have ended up being like a mood or hot zone or we could have ended up causing who knows what kind of uh, plague. Instead, we're probably going to get a really nice article in the New England Journal of Medicine. So it's a kind of a lemon lemonade situation here. But I still should preface this with pretty much don't leave your director unattended. Um, so, I, I, so it could have been a scab story, but instead it had a happy ending. So again, um, one of the things I always talk about is why preserve? Why are we doing this? Why are we spending so much time and money, uh, you know, to, to ensure the, that these uh, sometimes disturbing, uh, you know, definitely not the most photogenic uh, types of specimens are, are, are preserved? It's because, as you saw with the scabs, these are so incredibly important. They, are, they represent a vast amount of, of medical and historical knowledge that we can actually use to enhance our knowledge about medicine, about the natural world, uh, about all sorts of things. And it really, um, one of the things I'm doing now as director of the Muda Research Institute is I'm harnessing the uh, inherent informational power of these objects to help us uh, better learn about ourselves as humans, to better learn about how we get sick, how we get better. Um, you know, so we are we are saving lives with our collection, and uh, you know, with these these uh, these scabs and these orthopoxes, uh, we're working. We're actually working with uh, the CDC to help them better uh, figure out how to cure or treat monkeypox, which is endemic in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It has a 30% mortality rate. It kills kids. So we're going to try and and, and really um, help them. Uh, so again, these 19th century collections really do have 21st century uh, relevance. It's up to us to save them. It's up to us to uh, get the word out that they need to be utilized by these scholars um, that very often dismiss us. And you know, it's really just something uh, that we really want to um, uh, spread the word. So again. Um, these are just two uh, uh, examples of some of the publications we recently did with some of, uh, not recently, but a couple of years ago, um, using uh, one of our cholera specimens. And uh, so again, um, please don't discount your, your, your specimens. And, and again, I always encourage you to make them available to researchers because um, it's that collaborative situation that really um, helps. And again, our job is to, is to is to store them correctly, to preserve them correctly, um, and then to and then to make them available to to be used. So that's again what the Muda Research Institute is doing. Um, one of the things I always talk about is I like to give a shout out to the uh, CCAHA, the Conservation Center for Art and Historic uh, Artifacts. Um, you know they they don't really do a lot with. Um, the, wet, the, the, the biological specimens, but they've really given us a great preservation plan. Um, they started, it was a 2008 to 2012 plan, um, and it was my kind of touchstone. I was really able to utilize that um, as a way to um, not only uh, provide a checklist of me of things that I needed to accomplish, but it helped me show to my, to my superiors and to granting institutions, look, this is stuff I need to get done according to this you know, to the CCAJ and according to this governing, you know, to this this expert um, opinion. These are things that I need to get done to be the best that I can be. So please give me the funds to do it. So um, if you can get a preservation plan done, I highly, highly recommend that you do it. I mean, obviously it does not have to be done with CCAJ. There's lots of other places that can do it. But to have a preservation plan done is just so, um, I, I found it invaluable. 
So uh, basically, in conclusion, I like to say that uh, one of my basic things is, uh, you know, you may want to, uh, you may not be able to, you know, think outside the box, but I definitely encourage you to uh, think outside the jar. So thank you. And I, I have no idea. I apologize for all of the audio issues, but if we have time for some questions, I'll uh, be happy to answer them. And of course, you know, I will definitely make a point to um, answer questions in a written format if people are not allowed or can't stay online uh, afterwards. So thank okay. you so much. So um, can you hear me? I can hear you, Susan. OK. Um, all right. I'm going to read out the questions. I also want to uh, please uh, remember to do the evaluation. And we'll go on for about another 10 minutes. And whatever, sure. are, whatever are not answered, I will give uh, the questions that aren't answered, I will give to Anna. And, Anna and she will answer them in writing, and I'll post them with the uh, recording. And the recording, the PowerPoint slides, the handouts, everything, once it's posted, you won't see the advertisement for this webinar on our web page. So once you no longer see that, you know to look in the archives. Okay, okay. so the first question, how are what samples topped off? You, there's some questions about that later, and I think you covered it. But um, we, uh, let's go on to the next one. And okay. we'll, okay. when we get to the specimens, we'll answer this. Sure. Um, why the big change in the type of patronage over the last 40 years? Ah, that's a great question. Um, well, basically, um, it's because of our the way we made the um, museum accessible. So we started, I mean, we still are a fellowship-based um, institution. So we are a professional society. Uh, we have, but we only have about, about 1,400 fellows. That's it. And so, um, it, it, you know, about 40 plus years ago, it was really only the fellows that came to the museum. And they, maybe they brought their medical friends. And then we used to have a lot of um, medical conferences here. But the general public did not know the Mütter Museum existed. And it was Gretchen Warden, who was the curator uh, before me. And she started here uh, in about 1973. And uh, she started out like. Uh, both of us kind of worked our way up. I came in in 2004 as an assistant collections manager. And I believe she started in 1973, kind of in the same way. And uh, she became the curator in the 1980s. And so she ushered in a new era of really um, making the public aware that this museum existed. And it was under her that the attendance rose from a couple hundred to a couple thousand uh, people a year. And by the time of her death in 2004, we were getting about 60 to 66,000 visitors a year. So a huge uh, raise in, in the amount of people that we got a year. And then from 2004, to now, we're at 174, 175,000 visitors a year. And um, I, I can't take credit for, for all of that. I mean, it's really just a testament to how interested people are in, well, basically in themselves, in, in, in humanity, in the human body, in what makes us tick, in all the different ways uh, things can go wrong with us. And um, we're, we're just inherently curious about ourselves. And that's what we show here in the, in the museum. And uh, I, think that has a lot, I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a question as, about the early slides. Are what we see, see are well, what I go we back are to seeing, the early ones? is it an exhibit or is it storage? And I think those are the exhibits. Uh, the very slides. first slides, you, yes, the very first slides you saw, that was, I can, I can go back, I think. I don't know if there's a way for me to go all, is, are people seeing what I'm, what I'm showing? Yes. I'm just going to go all the way back to. And while you're looking, yes. on our, mm -hmm. let's see, are your models accession pieces of your collections? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. And what um, percentage, everything. What percentage of specimens are on ex exhibit versus storage? Yes, uh, <laughs> that all depends on our inventory, which uh, we're still working on. I would estimate we have approximately uh, about 11, 11 to 13% of our, uh, of our entire collection, not just specimens, but our entire collection is on exhibit, which is a fairly high amount, I believe. Um, so what you're looking at right now, this is our upper floor. And so what I, I think one of the issues I was talking about that's a big issue is our um, is vibrations in our mezzanine. So um, where my arrow is right now, this is kind of um, where you walk in. This is the main entrance. So you walk in, and one of the first things you see, you see Dr. Muter's portrait. And you turn here, and this is um, there's this is a mezzanine. So this, this whole area around here, there's no um, support. Uh, I mean, it's not it's perfectly safe. We've had it assessed. But when you have a lot of people uh, walking here, you have vibrations. And so one of the problems is that we have was the vibrations translating it to, to the specimens and causing damage. That's one of the things that I, was, I, had, I had to take care of um, when I was here. So, and you can also see, um, again, the reason that we're able to have so many, such a high percentage relatively of our specimens on exhibit is because of our object to square foot ratio. It's, it's quite dense. So if you take a look here, we pack in a lot of uh, things to see. So while we are, like, well, again, while the square footage of the museum is pretty small, if you are coming here and you're reading the labels, it'll take you a good two and a half to three hours to get through the museum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know that the first time I went to the meter, it was open, like, on Tuesdays if it had been shining for the past uh, five Mondays or something. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I yeah. guess, you know, you just raised a really good point. I should mention that we are open, not only are we open seven days a week, we're open 361 days a year. So if you want to talk about a nightmare in terms of curatorial issues and how do I put up a new exhibit, it's called I Spend a Lot of Nights at the Museum. Oh, I have to do everything after five. So I, you know, if it's a small thing, I can I can get I, I my usual working hours are eight to four. Um, I stagger all my employees. I have some that are uh, that work uh, past five o'clock. I have some that work before. So we all are here a little bit. Some of us are here a little bit before opening hours, which are ten. Our usual uh, the, the museum is open from ten to five. So myself, I am an uh, I'm an eight to four. My collection manager is a seven to three. My exhibit designer is a uh, he's usually at like a a 10 to 6, you know, it, we all do what we have. And then, of course, we're all on standby. We're here later or earlier whenever we need to be. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, do you have any specific processes or advice for storing models made of different types of materials? For example, plastic arms with rubber tubes to sim stimulate or simulate circulation. That's your Mary um, Rock. Yes. Uh, so, uh, are they talking about when the the model itself the model itself has multiple different types of material? Yeah, I think so. Um, one of the things you just have to be careful about is um, e to make sure that the what, that the material. I mean, if you're dealing with rubber, it's it's an issue of just time. It is going to harden and break over time. Make sure all of the if there's tubing, it's well supported. I don't really know if there's anything, if there's any fighting against entropy. Um, it, you know, you in many cases for us, if um, if we're going to display something and it, it's like a stethoscope, for instance, and it's a it's a, um, a stethoscope that had tubing that absolutely just cracked over time. You know, we have two options: we can either replace the tubing and make a point saying the tubing has been replaced, but the metal parts are original, or we can lay out. The broken, the broken tubing. Um, I really don't know, and maybe somebody else can say if there's anything you can particularly do to maybe uh, delay the um, thing. I think just keeping it in the proper temperature, its humidity, um, will delay the uh, the hardening of things like rubber and plastic. It's also what kind of plastic it is. Is it plastic that was made kind of the early plastics like Bakelite? That'll be different than kind of more modern plastics. So um, plastics are their own 
beast. Um, and also it's like you, you ought to make sure that, the, 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 again, heat and plastics don't go very well. Um, light, light and plastics don't go very well. Um, so, yeah, you just really got to make sure um, that you're maintaining uh, you know, the proper uh, temperature, the proper humidity. Again, cooler is always better. Um, you know, heat for the majority of all of your specimens is, uh, or the majority of your collection is bad. But again, you don't want, obviously, freezing cold temperatures. Don't let the climate control fail if you live in, like, a northern temperatures, too, because then you deal with uh, making the plastics or the rubber become extraordinarily brittle. So yeah. that's some of the issues. So you want to maintain, it's all about maintaining a consistent climate. And I, we all know exa exactly how hard that is to do. Um, so again, like I said, especially with my wet specimen uh, storage units, I have redundant, I have two slimline, uh, Fujitsu slimline units. So when one, if one fails, I have another one. So if, if you have a capability of having an external um, or, or a, a redundant unit. Um, another thing to think about, does everybody have a disaster plan? I mean, that's another entirely separate webinar that, and an entirely separate thing you have to talk about is your disaster plan, um, and you have to talk about your backup power source. Do you have generators? Do you have, what kind of generator is it? Is it the type of generator that um, is hooked into a gas source so it automatically kicks in six seconds after you, you lose power? Or does a physical person have to be on site to start it? Um, sorry, I just gave you another webinar to do. But, you know, yeah. th these are the type well, of, you know, th but these are all tied in because, you know, you have a catastrophic loss of your climate control that's, that's it. But, you know, in best practice, when you, at Bayshia, can you just want to maintain uh, that and so you're talking about a relative humidity and the cooler temperatures. Um, we're going to do a webinar on preservation of plastics, I think, in November or October, and the end of next month we're doing a webinar on contracting for disaster recovery. Uh, with uh, the, uh, so pay attention to those. And I, I'm going to ask you to ask one more question, and then we're going to have to go. But um, you mentioned that you had a an adipose um Let's see. You, you had a you had a soap mummy or a soap. So what uh, what is that? The soap lady. Uh, the soap lady. Yeah. She is an adipose seared body. So adipocere mm -hmm. is a uh, what we call a taphonomic event. Uh, so it's a post-mortem um, manifestation. When a body, uh, when an individual dies and their body enters an environment that has very specific um, uh, elements involved. So in this case, um, she, she died and she went into a, a situation where there was a basic pH of the soil. It was anaerobic. And in most cases, there's a higher moisture content in the soil. However, the in, the intrinsic, you know, the basic moisture of the human body will also suffice. But those um, those criteria, like those basic things, like those combine, and the body fat on the person undergoes a chemical change, and it go turns from body fat to something called adipocere. And adipocere is a waxy, tallowy, soapy-like substance. Um, that uh, does two basic things. It forms a protective barrier uh, around the body, but also, and this is kind of very important, insects don't like the way it tastes. So it uh, it hinders in them in the, in the decomposition process because uh, insects are key in the decomposition process. Um, so uh, basically, that's the reason why she's so well preserved. And so the, the question is, for display and upkeep, how how do you... Maintain that. Ah, and she. That's going to be the last to, question. Okay. Well, it's a very easy question. She's okay. How do I put this? She's shelf stable. So oh, do I have a picture of her? She. Uh, yes, I, you she did. Is, I, okay. There is absolutely no uh, extraordinary measures taken. She is. There's no refrigeration. There is no desiccant. There is no. Um, there's nothing. I have nothing. She is in a glass. She's in a plexiglass. Uh, case, and all I do is I use a fi I use fiber optic lighting. I don't put any halogen lighting on her, uh, but she is in the exact same temperature as the as the human is as, as, as the patronage, and uh, she's absolutely fine. 
She is actually one of my more, she's less high maintenance than my wet, than my wet specimens. I see. Um, Mike just put up a, a link to that. So um, I'm going to send you the, the rest of the questions for you to answer. And I'll post okay. those answers, questions and answers with the recording. So if you, in a couple of days, when you no longer see the ad for this, um, you'll know to look to see all the questions and answers. But thank you so much. And oh, this was really fun. thank you, everyone that was here. And uh, thank you, Mike. And um, we will uh, see you in a couple of weeks when we do the next webinar on preservation of industrial artifacts, something entirely different. So thanks. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Take care, everybody. Oh, and Susan, send me those uh, people, then I'll get out. I will personally email uh, or personally mail them uh, some plushy uh, pathogens. Yes, I'll, I'll send you everything. So awesome. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye, everybody.